Uh, we're going to be doing a biblical citizenship in modern America class kicking off uh, in October, October 12th on a Wednesday night. It's an eight-week long class, uh, but it's actually going to be over nine weeks because we're going to take the Wednesday off right there before Thanksgiving. Um, but before I show you a, a clip of that, I wanted to talk to you about politics and the church because uh, a lot of you know uh, this past Wednesday night we held a grassroots meet and greet in here uh, with a number of uh, Senate candidates and uh, Lynn County supervisors and things like that. Uh, there was five men that were scheduled to be here and speak, and there ended up being a couple more than that. It, it was a great night, uh, pretty much a, a packed house like this, a lot of great conversation, questions and answers. And um, It's interesting, though, leading up to it and, and, and maybe even especially after it, um, you know, I've taken a lot of heat for that. You know, a, a lot of people going, you know, shame on you. You know, the church isn't supposed to, you know, talk on political uh, you know, subjects, you know, there's supposed to be a separation of church and state, and, you know, there's this perversion of an idea out there that the church is supposed to be silent when it comes to issues of the state, whether that's your local state government or your federal government, that the church is not supposed to be involved in that. Listen, that's a fallacy. That's a lie. That, that, that's, that's been perverted over time to get you to believe that the church isn't allowed to do that. Um, and, and, and I could sit here and explain away why we've gotten to this point, but there's a really quick video that does it better than I would ever do it. And so I'm going to show you that, and then I'm going to ask you to do your own research, okay? Uh, and then when you figure out, like, what is right, you know, let your voice be heard, okay? Would you run that real quick? It's time we properly address the wall. I'm not talking about the border. I'm talking about the wall separating church and state. The phrase separation of church and state has been one of the most widely misunderstood and misused phrases in our country. These five words has even changed our constitution and made their way into U.S. Supreme Court opinions, even being referred to by Supreme Court justices as a constitutional commitment. The problem is, this phrase is nowhere in the constitution. Not only is this phrase not in the U.S. Constitution, but every single state constitution makes explicit references to God and religion. The phrase separation of church and state did come from one of our founding fathers, Thomas Jefferson, who used it in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Church in Connecticut. They were concerned that the First Amendment was not strong enough to protect their religious freedom. Jefferson assured them that the Constitution built a wall separating church and state, meaning that the state could not also control the church. So if this phrase isn't in the U.S. Constitution and its original use by Thomas Jefferson meant the opposite of how it's being used today, how did it become so indoctrinated in our policy debates and even U.S. Supreme Court opinions? Justice Black wrote in the landmark 1947 case, Everson v. Board of Education. In the words of Jefferson, the First Amendment clause against establishment of religion by law was intended to erect a wall of separation between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. Sounds nice, but any idea what Justice Black was doing before joining the Supreme Court? He was a member of the Ku Klux Klan, a racist, anti-Catholic organization that included separation of church and state as part of their creed, to which new members, who Justice Black was in charge of for the largest Klan cell in the South, pledged their allegiance to the eternal separation of church and state. Justice Black twisted Jefferson's original quotation and strategically embedded it in Supreme Court jurisprudence. Since then, Justice Black's wall, which has become the modern interpretation of the phrase, has been used to promote intolerance and discourage people of faith from participating in the public square. According to constitutional law professor Daniel Dreisbach, for much of American history, the phrase separation of church and state and its attendant metaphoric formulation, a wall of separation, have often been expressions of exclusion, intolerance, and bigotry. These phrases have been used to silence people in communities of faith and to exclude them from full participation in public life. Properly understood, there should be a separation of church and state, one that prohibits the federal government from controlling religion and churches. At a time when religious people are being targeted more and more by government through bad policies, unelected bureaucrats, and liberal activists, we would do well to remember Jefferson's vision and the true meaning of separation of church and state. So it's, it's laid out pretty well for you there. Um, you know, I, I've done my own research. Uh, all of that is true. There, there, there is a lot more involved in that, but the bottom line is, 
uh, the, the state just simply wanted to silence the church because, you know, the, the moral majority uh, was, was helping to lead this nation in a godly way, and that's not the direction that you know, the bureaucrats wanted it going in. And so, you know, uh, you saw back in the 40s, they effectively uh, inserted that into, you know, Supreme Court policies and you know, it, it all began to unravel by the 60s prayer and the Bible were taken out of schools. We're now 60 years from the day or from the year that, that the Bible was taken out of schools and our country is, is all but unrecognizable today. We're in a, a free fall as a nation, spiritually speaking, and that's exactly the way that the devil wants it. If the church continues on the path that it's on, uh, there's no turning back. Listen, I, I would never suggest to... Uh, I would never suggest to you who you should vote for specifically, uh, but my encouragement will always be go out and vote your faith. Get involved in the process. Run for public offices. We need men and women of faith who are running at the grassroots level for school boards, for uh, town councils, mayor, um, you, you know, state senator, Lynn County. Pick any office you want in this state. Seek the Lord and get after it. Because that's truly how I believe we're going to affect change in this nation. I believe God still has a plan to bring revival to the land. And it's going to be through the church refusing to silence itself. Because, listen, the government's not supposed to be able to do that. If it does it, it's because we're letting it. And I refuse to walk down that road. Okay, so one of the ways that I think we can be better involved is to understand the, 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 the rich spiritual history of our country, which is why we want to do this class. Uh, again, October 12th, we're going to kick it off. Uh, it's eight weeks long, uh, but we're, like I told you, we're going to skip that week at Thanksgiving so that it'll be over a nine-week period. Um, how you can sign up, simply go to our website, calvarycedarrapids.com. I know a lot of you already have signed up because I sent an email out. For those of you that get my emails and you haven't signed up, that's still in your inbox. You can sign up. There's no cost to you, okay? Um, and then, uh, so go to the website if you didn't get the email, calvarycedarrapids.com. Uh, right at the top of that page, there's four buttons. One of them says biblical citizenship. You click that and you'll find some of the information about the class. There's a short video that I want to show you now. It's less than a minute long and it helps to explain, you know, the idea behind this. So would you run that video? Hi, I'm Rick Green, America's Constitution Coach. I'm actually in the room where the Constitution was framed and where the Declaration was created and signed. This is Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. You know, a lot of times you ask yourself, how do I become a good citizen? What do I do to live out my freedom in this amazing nation? How do I honor those who came before me that sacrificed for me to be able to have this freedom? And as a believer, how do I live out a biblical citizenship in modern America? Well, we're going to walk through all of those questions. We've got a lot of great people that are going to comment on that. And I'm going to teach you in this very room where the Constitution and the Declaration were created. I'm going to teach you the founding documents of America and the biblical worldview that was sown into our nation from the very beginning. So join us on this incredible journey, biblical citizenship in modern America. So I, I do think it would do us all well to, to get involved in that. Uh, we, I did talk to our youth ministry, and we're going to uh, have the youth come out and be involved in that. We think it's especially important uh, for this younger generation to understand the history that's being either erased or rewritten in this country. So uh, please make sure to get the younger people involved in that. Uh, get involved in it yourself. Like I said, there's no charge to it, uh, but we do think it, it's, it's incredibly important. So uh, all that said, I think we need to pray and get into our, our study here this morning, the reason with that, that we're gathered in this place. Lord, we want to thank you for Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to be here together this morning, to, to walk through this section of Scripture, to be encouraged by you, Lord God, in the, in the storms and the trials we face in this life. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's get our Bibles out, uh, make our way over to the...